it's uh, a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful for the invitation and I'm excited about the brief time that we have together tonight for me to offer to those of you here in the audience, what I believe is the role of the modern dentist in treating edentulous sites, edentulous spaces. First thing, the course description we wanted to cover due to the varying complexities of dental treatment options for partially and fully edentulous patients. What this course will give an effort to address is to uncover some of the various surgical and prosthetic options. The course will offer a quick look at some options that are protocol based and successfully repeatable. The objectives that we offered was to identify treatment op options for edentulous sites, to discover how to offer viable treatment plans to patients, and to promote further study and inspire the desire to acquire the skills appropriate for the modern dentist. Now, I've been on my implant journey for some 27 years. And uh, implant dentistry, I will say, share with you, is a journey. And along that journey, as we treat patients, we got to recognize and accept the fact that patients come to us with different sets of wants, needs, and circumstances. And so we have to be able, and you'll hear me emphasize this throughout the procedure or throughout the course, we have to be able to give our patients choices. They deserve the right to have choices to be able to have their mouths restored. Now, implant dentistry, as we well know, is a restorative discipline. I'll say that again. Implant dentistry is a restorative discipline. Sometimes it has a simple surgical component. Simple in that if I've got adequate bone and I've got adequate height, width, and length, I can place an implant and I can create a restorative solution. So it has a simple surgical component at times. Implant dentistry is a restorative discipline. And we'll call it in the aesthetic zone, a restorative discipline with a challenging surgical component. And so we're gonna explore and show some cases where we have to manage the challenge and develop the skills to be able to address the aesthetic zone with implant dentistry. Implant dentistry is a restorative discipline. And sometimes implant dentistry has the need for advanced skillful surgical skills. So we're gonna talk about that because we owe it to our patients when circumstances, situations happen to be able to restore them so that we can bring it back to what would maybe be classified as a challenging component in the aesthetic zone. Now, this quote was given to me some 25 plus years ago. The goal of the modern dentist is to restore the patient to normal contour, function, comfort, aesthetics, speech, and health, regardless of the degree of atrophy that they present with, the degree of disease, or even injury to the stomatonathic system. My principal mentor in implant dentistry is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Oscar Hilt. Tatum Jr. And he's the individual accredited to giving me this phrase. We added an additional component to it. If normal health is permitting, sometimes patient's health might dictate that we go with a different option or a different choice based on how they're going to respond and heal to some of the advanced surgical procedures. So we have to put that in there as a caveat. But what's our goal? Our goal is to address to create a natural implant solution in stable alveolar bone. And it might be bone and soft tissue that we are creating. Now, the implant industry, the restorative discipline with a simple surgical component, we all know if you got adequate bone and got adequate height um, to replace missing teeth with dental implants and restorations where edentulous sites are adequate, we just go about our process. Now, here's a case where I extracted a tooth and did a ridge preservation graft. I think ridge preservation grafts have a place and are significant because they give us width and height. They preserve it longer so that we can come back in in a situation like this, having lost this tooth, we place an implant 
in the posterior region of the molar. We create a prosthetic component after three and a half or three months of healing, and we create a restorative solution. Here's the restoration from a lateral view, and here's that restoration in place pretty much the day that it was delivered. And you can see the emergence of that implant and the tissue, and we got a reasonably good result with that in the simple approach. Here's the restoration here with a tapered implant, all right? So you get to look at it from a couple of views. Another case, a simple surgical component, an implant, different design, has some features which we'll talk about that we like, um, but that allows us to have an adequate width, adequate height, adequate height, and we place our implant. In this case, we're gonna do a, use some modern technology and do a scan body, take a digital impression of this case, have this restored, and in this case, do a screw retained solution. But there we have a situation where we got a simple surgical component and we go about the process. Another case, this case that I have done a ridge preservation where we lost a tooth. Implant was placed. There the implant is healing after three months. A solution is created. And that patient has a solution for the replacement of tooth number 19. All right. Now. Given the time that we have, let's jump into when you talk about a challenging surgical component. This individual is a friend of mine. He was he was NBA referee. He happened to experience going in, in a game where he got going through the foul line and he caught an elbow from one of the uh, NBA athletes. They knocked out his two front teeth. So he ended up losing number eight and number nine. And so ultimately he had to have implants replaced and we created a solution where he didn't have those teeth replaced with Crown and Bridge. And we have a lot of things that we have to give some consideration to when we have implants in the aesthetic zone. And there that case is in, mouth, in his mouth and then with the occlusal view. Here it is again, all righty. Another case, different sets of wants, needs, and circumstances. This patient comes to me. He was a referral from a colleague, but he wore a Maryland bridge for many years. You can see the remnants of the cement on this wing, on this tooth, where the, the wing of that Maryland bridge was sit. This wing had a bar that wrapped around and afforded him the opportunity to have what he deemed necessary, and that was to have a diastema. He was born with a space between his two front teeth. He wanted that space between his two front teeth. And so some, some colleague of ours was very creative and created a Maryland bridge for him that would work. His comment to me or his, his circumstance to me was that the, the Maryland bridge would last about Two, uh, two and a half years, and they, they, either it would break or what we've all been, who've been around a while, we've dealt with Maryland Brisk, it would become debonded. So he came to me with a solution or wanting a solution for something more permanent. So I said, sure, I can give you your space. I'll just place an implant and we'll create a, a solution. We don't have to worry about the Maryland Bridge. We could place our implant, put in a restoration, Here's the implant, here's the restoration. He got what he wanted. He got his space between his two front teeth. I don't get to see him much, except for maybe out in the city of Atlanta uh, at restaurants. And he says, doc, I appreciate the fact that I got a solution. It's been years and years and years. I still have my space and my implant solid. And that Maryland bridge is a thing of my past. Here is that implant in place with the restoration. And here's another view of that. In the aesthetic zone, things are a little different. All right, here's another case. Patient lost this tooth. We immediately placed an implant. I find that the bone sets the tone, and it's been aptly said, and the tissue's the issue. And I find that in my hands, the best time to place an implant in the aesthetic zone is the day I take out the tooth for best and more optimal 
aesthetic results. So I do immediate placement. So we have immediate placement here. Here's our restoration. I mean, our, our implant in place with our abutment in place some months later. And here's our restoration again. Here we have a custom abutment and we have our final restoration there um, for that particular patient. The day we delivered the case, I fully anticipate that I would get papillary feel here, but I anticipate that will take uh, maybe a couple of months. So now the role of a modern dentist where we have a dentalist sites that are inadequate. Our goal is to expand the ridge and or perform a procedure or a technique called osseodensification. So I chose to put in a case to, that shows both expansion of the ridge and osseodensification. But when we talk about regenerative procedures, when we lack adequate bone, we have to develop the skills to do ridge preservation grafts, to do bone expansion via osseodensification, to do sinus lifts and lateral tatum sinus augmentation procedures, to do hard tissue regeneration via onlay grafts, to do soft tissue regeneration via connective tissue grafts. So here's a case where I have bone expansion and I have osseodensification. This case came to me. She had a, a few edentulous sites. And what you'll see is I expanded this ridge. This ridge lacked uh, a lot of width. As I go back, right at the, the mid crest on this, she had a, less than two millimeters of bone. So we therefore had to expand this ridge to, to place our implant. So here we have it where I expanded the ridge using osteotomes. And this is a, an osteotome where I've gone and then I shift. I shift to uh, denser burrs and I perform osteodensification to expand this ridge, all right? So that I don't have to go first into a graft. I placed implants in the posterior where she was a dentalist. And I just make one comment, my strategy, my goal, following expansion and osseodensification this implant was placed slightly paddled, three millimeters beneath the line drawn between the CEJ of the adjacent teeth of the adjust of, of the edentulous site. I just commented there that that was my goal and that's what we achieved. And then here we have a situation where you see my implants in place. I'm, I'm in the posterior where I had adequate bone, adequate height, and I'm also in the anterior area where you have to manage the aesthetics. So here I have a screw retain solution for her. And then I have a final result, this result where this is my implant. My tissue is mature. And uh, you can see where I got, got good papillary feel. And that tooth obviously functions really well for her. So we got a great result there. Here's another case. I inherited this case from a periodontal colleague. And that periodontal colleague had extracted the tooth and done a graft for me. Now my patient had some other concerns, which we were obliged to address. And so we ultimately found ourselves in a situation where we had to redo the graft that was presented to me. I went in after six months into the original graft and found out, found myself in very soft bone even though I was making an effort to densify that bone. And so what I elected to do was regraft the site. And in my protocol, I wait three to four months, and then I come back and densify and place an implant in. So here I have my implant in place. Here's where the patient presented to me. And here's where I delivered this case. And this is the day of delivery. All right. And here's our final, as it relates to how that case looked because we had the opportunity to do some cosmetic dentistry along with replace the tooth at site 11. And here he is with his smile. And there you have a panoramic view of the implants that was placed at 11 and the restorations that were placed. Now, we talked about implant dentistry being a restorative discipline. 
And sometimes you have to develop advanced skills to be able to perform certain surgeries to create a foundation to subsequently place implants and then do functional restorations that look good, function well, and last a long time for your patients. So here, uh, one skill that you want to be able to acquire and learn is to know how to do what's called an internal sinus lift. And so I show a couple of cases. This is a case where I did a few different things. This tooth was compromised, as you can see, and this tooth was extracted. Now, the way I extract molars and the way I extract teeth in the cosmetic zone is different than the way we were, may have been taught when we were in school. So I actually immediately section a molar, even if it's not as compromised as this one cervically. I section it, and in a manner where I can take out the mesial root, the, the distal buccal root, and then the palatal root. Inevitably, a lot of times when I take out first maxillary molars, I find myself with a septum of bone that I have preserved. And so what I'm doing in this case, that this is a few slides beyond where I started, I start to osseodensify this septum of bone, expand it. Yes, I graft the gaps around where the residual roots were, but I also in this case had to elevate the sinus. So I'm doing a surgical extraction of a first molar, I am taking the remaining septi of bone and I am densifying it. I am placing an immediate implant and I'm elevating the sinus at the same time. On this particular case, that was referred to me. I cover it with a cytoplasm membrane and allow that to heal. I give it three, four months of healing and then I go into my restorative process. And so ultimately, you can see here where I've got an implant placed immediately, it's allowed to heal, and I've got a molar restoration where I've lifted the sinus, and I've gone about the process of densifying the septia of bone in between the maxillary molar and placed an implant immediately. And here this implant is, and this is a screw retained solution where I'm placing it the day I'm, the patient's coming back, and this is at about five months. So now, another case, showing a regenerative skill that's necessary to be able to give patients choices and give them an option. Here's a case where I've obviously got a pneumatized sinus. My protocol and my parameters of doing a pneumatized sinus is where I've got, I teach where I have six millimeters I'm gonna elevate the sinus. I probably, within my skill set and my experience, comfortable doing three millimeters of residual bone. At any rate, I place my anterior implant, and then I take this residual ridge, and through a process of auto-lifting the sinus with denser burrs, which is how I approach this craft now, I elevate the sinus and place the distal implant. So here you have this, after some weeks of healing, I've got my transmucosal components in place and I am going to allow it to integrate for three to four months. And then I come back and create a solution where in this case, I created a screw retain solution over this of a three unit bridge in the posterior maxilla where most patients lose their teeth in the posterior maxilla first. And so we have to develop skills to manage the sinus, which leads me to this next skill that you have to acquire to be able to adequately give patients choices and meet their needs when it comes to edentulous sites. And this is the, we call it the Tatum lateral wall sinus augmentation because Dr. Tatum is the person who gave the world this procedure basically cutting a window into the sinus. Here you have a situation where, as you can see, this sinus is completely pneumatized. This person has maybe a millimeter, a millimeter and a half of residual bone. And in this case, 
we graft the sinus through the lateral wall, as you can see here illustrated. And we place implants, in this case, 17 millimeter implants. And then we are able to restore this case. Another case, this patient's a friend of my father's and he came in with a need. I met him on a panel where we were given a discussion to young students about making an effort to be whatever you wanted to be. He happened to be a political strategist. And I was talking to them about my field that I have such passion for, which is the field of dentistry. He came to me after the panel discussion and said, hey, Dunson, I am going on Thursday, this was a Sunday evening, to have these teeth taken out and I'm getting set to have dentures. He asked me, what was my thought? I said to him, I don't know. I have to have you come to my office. Let's take an x-ray and let's see where you are. This is a film pan. This was, I did this procedure in the late 90s. We ultimately chose the decision. As you can see here, he has his anterior six teeth. He has no posterior teeth. We did bilateral sinus augmentations. We placed in multiple implants in the posterior mandible. I mean, posterior maxilla, excuse me. And we did crown and bridge over his teeth. His desire, unlike my friend I mentioned before, was to have his space closed between his two front teeth. We ultimately placed another implant at site 30, and we did some porcelain restorations on the lower anterior. But his goal, different from my patient that I mentioned earlier, his want was, I'd like to have my space closed if I could. For years, I've wanted to have that done. So we accommodated him by doing restorations on his anterior teeth and closed this space. And as you can see in the buccal corridor, where we have replaced the teeth that he lost via implant dentistry. And here he is with his smile, with his diastema mostly closed. And here we have his implants. And as I was sharing with you, this case was done in the 90s, bilateral sinus augmentation, implants, and restorations in the anterior. But we chose not to take out his teeth. We chose to save his teeth because the skill of being able to do a lateral wall sinus was within our repertoire to be able to give that patient that choice. Now, I wanted to point out something. Here you can see these implants I placed in the late 90s. But let's talk a little bit about our role again. Our role as modern dentists is to progressively refine and evolve with the science of implant dentistry. I've been on this journey for, like I shared with you, over 27 years. And during my journey, in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, I was placing, commonly done at that time, straight walled implants. And so you can see this. Now, here's my reality. I still get to maintain and see this patient on recare visits, and his implants are doing fine. Then the science evolved. We're doing the during my journey in the early 2000s and the mid-teens, I was using tapered implants because we determined that tapered implants were better, better for immediate placement, better for initial um, uh, fixation as it relates to the bone. And there were tremendous advantages to it. Now, during my journey or on my journey, from around 2018 to the present, I used tapered implants with different elements within the design of the implant that make it better for my, my outcomes because it has different features that will help it to have such. I've got, um, and you say, why Ditron? I, um, this, this, the engineering associated with this implant are supreme. They're 50 years of experience in medical devices with the company that makes Ditron implants. The accuracy level is up to one single micron. 
It has a patented reverse concave neck. There's benefits to that. So you can have overgrowth of bone so that you can have restorative platform switching. The apex design lends itself to a beautiful placement of this implant. It has the spherical helix chamber, which allows for bony ingrowth, better bone to implant contact, therefore better torque strength, which allow for stability and more predictable outcomes. And really important when you talk about what can I do, how can I have an implant that helps me overcome um, peri-implantitis, it's important as we know one element is to make sure there's a precision in engineering in the abutment and the implant connection. That is why Ditron for me at this juncture. Now, the role of the modern dentist, where you have edentulous sites that are inadequate, our goal is to develop the deficient sites with regenerative procedures. Now, we need to have as our role, everything available to us in science that are gonna give us the opportunity to enhance the outcomes, the predictable process, maybe even expedite some of the surgeries is to have this. So here you see where we're procuring uh, blood and we're gaining access to growth factors so that we can use PRP and PRF. I believe PRP still has a place when saturated within my allografts so that I can have great bone turnover and I have histologic studies to prove from one sinus to the second sinus where I have greater vital bone if I use PRP. Now we probably all on this call know the benefits of PRF in terms of PRF being a way that we can make our own membranes with growth factors within it that allow for the body to heal faster. Then if you mix PRP with your allografts, you can create what we call sticky bone. Sticky bone can form and be shaped and give us, gives us the benefit of having a good grafting material that, which allows us to get predictable grafting results. Now, through my journey, I've done a fair amount of onlay bone grafting procedures. In the early 2000s, mid 2000s, I was doing grafting procedures and I was doing them with crestal incisions. But what I learned from one of my mentors, Dr. Tatum, is to be able to do where possible only bone grafting through a remote incision will afford me the opportunity to be able to place my graft, stabilize it, and then close the surgical site away from where the graft is maturing, where the graft is healing. And here you have a situation, if you look closely, Here's my incision, anterior to 22, but my block graft was fixated distal to 22 on that deficient ridge that's presented there. And so let's take a case. Here's a case where I had a patient come to me. This gentleman was in his late 70s when he came, and I had the ability where he had a deficient ridge to go about a process. And as you can see here, he's lost vertical. And in the case, you can't see it here, but he's lost horizontal. And as you can appreciate here, where he's lost horizontal bone and vertical bone through this volumetric rendering, you can see how it's deficient. Now, what you see in the red line outline there is where I used to create my crestal incision, open that tissue up, make every effort to get very good reflection so that I put volume of bone into the site and then turn around and try to get primary closure. Not always easy. And even when I was able to create primary closure, some of the challenges with creating primary closure didn't happen the day I did the surgery. It was the sustainability of the soft tissue closure that created my challenge. And I'm sure those of you who've ever done an onlay graph, 
know exactly what I'm talking about when it relates to that. So my improvement or my progressive refinement in doing these kinds of regenerative procedures was to do a remote incision, which you see outlined here in terms of my incision in the blue. And so I have a remote incision. I go in and decorticate. Why do I decorticate? I decorticate, create holes in the bone to get it to bleed I, so I can deal with the RAP, the regional accelerated phenomenon so that I can have to promote angiogenesis into migration into the graft that I fixate in place. So here you have this patient that I was showing you. This is two weeks after I've done my graft. So he comes in for suture removal, post-operative evaluation. What you see here, an additional step that I did, the residual, is I put a periodontal pack over this ridge where I have these incisions and I fixated it obviously or I I made it engage the teeth here and so that's what you see there but I was making an effort to protect my soft tissue incisions so that they would not open but here you can see my block graft you can also see it if I go back you can see my block graft here and you can see my block graft here which is giving me significant volume, okay? And the block is back here, which I showed you in another case that I had. But here you see a lateral view at two to three weeks where I've built up this ridge pretty significantly, even close to the opposing dentition. But now, four months later, you can see where I placed implants. And this is actually a temporary with an implant underneath it. And you can see I have implants in bone. Here are my restorations. And again, this was done some, I think this was done in 2011 or 2012. But there is my three implants in the ridge that I built, which included vertical. Here are my crowns in place. Here's the left side mirrored view of the ridge that I built, crowns in place. And here's what we started with. So having the skill to be able to build vertical bone in the posterior mandible, to build vertical bone in the posterior maxilla is a skill that affords me the opportunity to give patients choices, which is, I believe, the role for us as dentists today. And here we have some images, some radiographic images of the implants in place. This is where the bone was before I did the grafts. And here's the bone now. Now this case is a case that's been done years ago. June, 2019, I'm following this case and maintaining them. And you can see, and one of the things we ought to talk about is when you do only bone grafting and I'm using an allograft, I do have a history of using autogenous grafts, but I just find in my hands, if I use an allograft and I saturate it with PRP and I put my fiber membranes in place and I put fiber membranes at the site of closure, which is remote, I have increased my success of successfully being able to create vertical bone height and with predictably uh, very successfully repeatable time and time again. So now you see us where I'm documenting the bone from, in this case, every two years, taking PA radiographs. And you can see that the height of bone is sustaining itself through the years. So now I even had the opportunity to follow this gentleman until he transitioned. And I have 2018 x-rays. Uh, where I still have the bone, bone still the same. So what we did was we gave this patient the choice. My first choice is always to build a foundation, if I may, to be able to provide an FP1 solution, which is a natural implant solution in stable alveolar bone. Again, here's where he started. 
and here's where he is now or where he was when I had the opportunity to see him. All right, here's another case. I live in Atlanta. This patient came to see me from Breckenridge, Colorado. She lost a blade implant, which historically was a type of endosseous implant that was wedged in very narrow bone. And when she came, her trips had to be short and well-planned because we wanted to do as much as we can within procedures. So this is what you had. That ridge looks like a hand grenade hit. You've lost vertical and you've lost all horizontal. Now, what I did, this is where I used to do my incisions. But with my modification in doing and learning the technique of being able to do remote incisions, I was able to modify my approach. I did expansion. And I illustrate this where I placed an implant the day she came here. So based on that placement of that implant, I chose to create my remote incision here. Now, what you're going to see are stills from a video camera because I taught this and showed this case live while teaching. Now, she came from a colleague of mine who had retired and he had placed in multiple implants through the years. So here I am doing what's placing in the, in the absence of having a guide. Uh, I'm using a spacer and positioner and I'm going in and placing that implant that I showed you which is sitting here. This is an implant I place. But as you can see there, this is a, she has lost complete, um, the complete ridge, vertical height as well as. Now you can see my implant is there. Here's my block graph going in. And again, that's coming from a steel on a camera. I'm working, I sterilize a model. And I'm trying to use the model to minimize using the black graph through the remote incision or the tunnel. And I'm fixating this to kind of get a sense of shaping it. Here's my graph going in. You see me shaping it. All right. And here's the graph going in. Now you can see where I was able. And I always when I do block graphs, which are working for me in terms of creating vertical height, is where there is bone that I can affix to. In this case, I did right above the inferior alveolar nerve. I have my implants and I have, I'm sorry, I have my fixation screws in place. You can see where in this case, I placed one fixation screw, but I could not get a fixation. No worries. I went in and placed particulate bone in and around that, closed it down, So we went from here, here's my block in place with a radiographic image. That tooth I have plans for, I'm just using it now, just in place. And here's where that ridge healed. So we go from here to here in a matter of three, four months. Here it is before, here you see my fixation screws. I'm away from the nerve and I cut a solution. So we were here. Then four months later, I placed my implants. My implants are in place there. Here's the before, here's the after. This is September, 2012, June of 2010. You see where she, how she came to me. Here is December, 2010. So six months later, I've got implants in and um, ultimately, you see it up close picture. I that tooth was removed. I no longer have a purpose for it. I actually chose to splint my three implants that I placed to create a section of implant supported FP1 solution for her. This is where my bone was before. You saw it in the clinical picture. Here's where the bone is now. And that has sustained itself. I have colleagues in Denver that helped me maintain her health. And I, I see them annually and they give me an update report that all is well and the implants are stable and everything looks good. Now, implant dentistry is a restorative discipline, but sometimes we run into cases where 
we're not able to keep teeth. This particular gentleman had a hundred had advanced perio throughout his teeth. It maybe I would have given an effort to save three teeth in this arch. Ultimately, what I did was place implants all on six in the maxilla, all on five in the mandible. And this may have been at this point, 2023, this was probably 11 years ago. Here's his solution in place. He got a smile that he was quite pleased with and very functional for him. But because I didn't feel confident, each tooth, I go by and give a good, fair, poor terminal prognosis to. After that, my restorative plan evaluates whether or not that tooth is worthy for me to save to put in a scheme to restore the, the arch and the arch opposing the arch for function. So a lot of things go into it. Another patient came to me more recently, came from another colleague, had an implant that I felt was not in a good position, we removed that implant. I placed some Ditron implants and created a, a fixed PMMA solution for him currently, but we're going to the zirconia final, but in his bottom left ridge, rather than take out the teeth that he has, and he's a 80 year old gentleman, we placed two implants. We created a sextant of implant supported bridges, a bridge, I'm sorry. And on one side, he already had some implants. We placed implants here. And here we are prior to torquing it down to its final position. And we got a bridge in place. So here he is here. What he has on his multi-units is a unique way in which I'm approaching provisionalizing a patient the day I do surgery or shortly thereafter. And here's another angle and view of those uh, unique abutments that fit right onto the multi-units. But what I show you is I've got a, a denture that I attach to those units, which you see here in soft tissue. And basically I just uh, trim out the palate. So the patient has the freedom of the palate and trim the tuberosities off and shorten that. And then I take him from here in a matter of two weeks to the PMMA, which allows the lab time to fabricate my PMMA. But while that is happening, the patient has a prosthesis that looks great, functions well for them. Here he is when it's PMMA. And, and obviously I'm showing this because it still required me to be able to do a sinus lift at the distal right side in terms of placement of the implant. Here's another case, came to me years ago. And this is how this patient presented. We got a whole lot going on, but he's walking around with that smile with a prosthesis that was made by a colleague, which mimicked what he had in his mouth at the time. Anyway, I identulated the patient because he had advanced perio and a lot of compromise and nothing supporting teeth and tremendous amount of mobility. Here's his residual rid having healed. Here's the lower. Here are my implants in place. And here's the fixed, complete denture that I created for him, given the fact that he was essentially a patient who was in a denture in the maxilla, and he had advanced, advanced perio in the, in the mandible. So therefore, it warranted him having his teeth removed. Maybe to be true, hard for me to share, a little bone reduction so that we can have restorative space for the solution. But here is where this gentleman uh, was able to get a solution. And he went from where you see him here to where you see him here in a matter of months. And here you have it here where he has a solution up top. That's a fixed, complete denture. And, I, and the lower arch, I just created two, an, a two implant locator over denture because the goal, and we are in process, I didn't want to reduce this bone, 
is to make him an FP1 implant solution where he has implant supported crown and bridge. And it's been 12 years, but now he's in process and thinking ahead to the possibility of, let me just place two implants in 21 and 28, and then ultimately come back and place implants in the posterior left region, mandible, and the posterior right mandible, and afford us the opportunity to have crown and bridge on the bottom arch, opposing a fixed complete denture. So here's another case. This patient, I remember who she is. She actually wore a denture for 25 years. A denture in the maxilla for 25 years. And the reason why I emphasize that, I think if I take a patient who's been wearing a denture and then I give them a solution that is a fixed, complete denture, I've done them a tremendously good service. And in this case, this patient, she said, I wish I had known about this years ago because she loves the fact that I placed implants and I created a solution for her. And she ultimately went from wearing a denture for 25 years. And now it's been some 10, 15 years where she is wearing a fixed complete denture. And that's her smile. That's good. Another case, a dentalist patient. My goal if I have an dentalist patient where possible is to give them fixed implant crown and bridge. But if I can not do that based on a need or economics, wants, needs, circumstances, I'm comfortable giving them a fixed complete denture. Here's another case. This is a good friend of mine. Um, and he had bottom teeth. He didn't want to have his bottom teeth removed. We placed implants here and in the mandible on the right side at 29 and at tooth number 25. And one place I do guide it, we'll talk about it, is when I'm dealing with restricted roots and sometimes when I'm doing complete arch solutions. But here's this case. This case is in place, been in, been in place for years. And he's very pleased with the fact that he went from wearing a denture to having a solution, which afforded him the opportunity to have access to his palate again. And so we created a solution there. Now this case I inherited, and there's a story behind this case. Uh, he has a solution in his mandible. He was referred to me with the understanding that he was going to have a fixed complete denture like he has on the mandible in the maxilla. And so I elected to and gave him a choice. And to be true, I had to convince him that I would much rather try to preserve his maxillary teeth where possible and replace the teeth that I cannot replace with technique skills and be able to create a restorative solution. So here you see his panoramic x-ray. And if you look at the amount of bone in the mandible and the implants placed, I really believe this could have been an all on uh, implants with the crown and bridge rather than a zirconia fixed solution. In this case, an all on six. The other thing about this, the previous colleague, and I'm not truly mad at this part of it, they chose not to reduce bone. This case, for it to be ideal, his arch, his, his teeth, he's showing more mandible than he is showing maxilla. But we're kind of stuck with it because this is where his wife said he's got to live with what he has on the bottom now because, you know, really we got to take care of the top. So what I chose to do was restore his front teeth, take out the back teeth that had advanced perio, and as you look down the buccal corridor, you can see my emergence of what is implant-supported bridge work. Here is the occlusal view. We're forced to match the color of the bottom teeth, which I did two or three times. First time I did it, I had a more natural, lifelike smile. He liked it. His wife didn't like it. Second time, they both didn't like it. 
So in the, I ended up taking off this lower fixed complete denture, sending it to my lab to have them create the solution that you see. So it matches perfectly the color, which is a little opacious for me, of the lower teeth. But there I have a three unit bridge. You can see a little bit of my implant here, but that's the right side, the left side, and that's the day of delivery. Here it is on the right side. And you can see I've got a bridge there. So I kept the front teeth that they were going to remove. And here's his solution here. That's a picture there. And my only critique of where we are is that I would have loved for the mandible to be about eight millimeters more or, or down so that his vertical dimension wouldn't have to be increased. But here's my solution. I've got my Dytron implants in the posterior maxilla. I've done some sinus lift processes. I extracted the teeth and placed my implants immediately. And I did anterior restorations on his front teeth. Uh, I'm very excited I shared that it. Uh, Dr. Danson managed to save the uh, top uh, teeth. Uh, especially now that I have uh, the bottom all on six, I have a chance to compare and it feels really different. Uh, not that uh, the difference bothers me, not at all, but just the fact that uh, the top are remaining, you know, natural teeth, uh, that makes me feel so much better than uh, having everything replaced with all on four or all on six. So I'm really happy uh, that the Dr. Danson gave me that option and uh, we've taken that decision to save the teeth. So I just want you to understand that we have to be able to develop skills to be able to do cases which warrant regenerative procedures. In this case, it was just a matter of philosophy. Philosophy for me is where I can save teeth, maybe even make them look better. Um, that's what I'd rather do. So the role of the modern dentist with the edentulous sites. Uh, and I commented on this, I'm not gonna go deeply into this, but where we have edentulous sites are present and they have restrictions, our goal is to have guided solutions. Two cases back, I showed you a case where I placed an implant at site 25, where my restriction between the radicular roots of 26 and 24, I use guides in those instances. Uh, when I'm placing laterals, or maybe in some instances where I'm doing aesthetic dentistry, I mean, in the, in the anterior zone, I use guides. And in some cases, when I'm doing full arch and I have restrictions, I do guides. So here's a case where this is actually my assistant. And uh, I used a guide on her because she actually had an accident when she was eight years old, and now she's 24. But anyway, I don't go through the details, but she had one millimeter of residual bone. I did a block graft, let it heal for four months. And so I share with you, I chose to place her lateral and her central through a guide. So I go through the process and we as modern dentists were appropriate. And maybe if you're very comfortable with guides and you feel like that's the way, you still got to do what we call brain surgery meaning freehand surgery where your brain is connected to your hand and guiding you through versus guides totally dominating how you got to do it. So with this case, this case came to me from Connecticut from a colleague of mine in the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. He sent her to me and he said, Bernie, I want you to help me with the case and I'm happy to oblige. She had implants that were failing. She had implants over on the lower right sextant that failed. And so um, ultimately I removed the implants that were present, gave her a interim denture prosthesis. And then I elected to do a guided case here. Uh, she's traveling distance. And so I have a stackable guide here. I ultimately placed implants and created a solution for her that's made of zirconia where I've got my implant strategically placed and I have a solution that you see there. Here is her mandible. I ultimately edentulated her mandible because her, the teeth were not 
they had a guard to poor prognosis for me. I placed five implants in the mandible and here's her maxillary prosthesis again. But there I placed all on four in the maxilla and all on five in the mandible. And there's her solution there. Uh, with a camera, she's quite pleased with that solution. And also my colleague who maintains her for me in Hartford, Cape Cod, Connecticut. Now, our role as modern dentists, as I go to conclude, is to progressively refine. And I think that we, if we're going to be practicing in the field of implant dentistry, we should make every effort to reach the highest distinction in the field. So the American Board of Oral Implantology is a credentialing board for those in the field of implant dentistry. So technically you achieve your board, you become boarded in oral implantology. Then after you get your board, you can challenge or shall I say submit to become a fellow in what is the oldest and most prestigious academy in implant dentistry, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, where you can get your fellowship. That's my ABOI board and that's my fellow. Now in conclusion, the role of the modern dentist is to replace missing teeth with dental implants and functional restorations that look good, function well, and last a long time. Where we have edentulous sites that are adequate, we need to place implants in those sites. And where the edentulous sites are inadequate, we need to develop the skills so that we can address the deficiencies in the sites with regenerative procedures. It is our role as modern dentists to give our patients choices. Choices, as you heard my patient share with you, I gave him the choice. He elected to go with my choice. He's pleased. He's not the only one who shares that with me. If I have a fixed complete, complete denture on one arch and an implant supported FP1 solutions on another arch, the patients always like the FP1 solution. The comment they make is that it feels more natural. So therefore they have a natural implant solution and stable alveolar bone. It's not that a complete denture is not a good thing because it is a fixed solution, but it's just not the same as having an implant supported restoration because you grew bone where you didn't have it and you built your system around what was natural to the patient. So it's our goal to progressively refine. Always we wanna get better, if we stop getting better, we should step away from the profession. We want to evolve with the science and provide better implant solutions. Dentistry science is art and it is business. We all have heard that. We use it from time to time, but we can't let business drive our provision of healthcare. So I ask you to ask yourself the question. What would you do for your mother or for your favorite aunt? Now, this is my godmother. And she came to me, and I want you to know I placed 10 implants. I have six in the maxilla, and I have four in, in the mandible. But this is where she has. So I did restorative dentistry on her anterior tree, teeth to create cosmetics. And I did implants, immediate placement, sinus lifts in the posterior maxilla and placed the implants in the posterior mandible following on leg grafts, particulate grafts to gain width on the lower left side. So I will do this now. This is her smile. Um, and she's pleased with that, but she has a natural implant solution in stable alveolar bone. I want to open it up to questions. I do teach the procedures that I showed, and obviously I was abbreviated in time. I actually direct a maxi course in Washington, D.C. There's my website if you want to come and learn with us so that we can continue to journey together. And then I have an institute in the city of Atlanta where I teach advanced surgical procedures and techniques um, and about hard and soft tissue regeneration 
And then I've got a course where I'm talking about streamlining full art solutions and protocols so we can make it easy. My practice is in the heart of Atlanta. I actually practice in this building that you see here. And so here is my contact. If you wanted to contact me, I'm available to answer any questions about anything beyond this conference, this webinar. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the questions. And the question was, what expansion method and tool did you use? I was taught to do expansion by using osteotomes. And so for years, I'm going to say if I started my journey in 1996, 1993, uh, I was doing expansion by using osteotones. There's a technique to using osteotones. I uh, do have a conscious sedation license, so it affords me the opportunity to expand bone. I've even expanded bone in showcases where I've expanded bone that was less than a two millimeters in, in diameter, but had adequate height. Um, but what I would share with you is since 2012, I was brought into the osteodensification camp prior to the Densibers being released because they knew I taught bone expansion. And so I use osteodensification burrs quite routinely to place my implants. And uh, I expand bone, I densify bone, and I lift sinuses with denser burrs. And I can do it if it's 2.7 millimeters in diameter. Uh, I can go about a process to get to my densification burrs. So I look at a densification burr as a osteotome on a latch, but there's technique to doing osteotomes and there's technique to using, to doing densification. So I hope that answers that question to that particular intended. Now, the second question, how and what do you use to sterilize the model? Please and thanks, okay? I just, now I'm using stereolithic models, I'm using printed models, but I actually just put them in a, a sterile bag and sterilize them in the autoclave. No problem, no, no issues there. That works out fine. Yeah. Um, are you in favor of splinting implants always? The answer to that question is no. Sometimes what I do in the, in re, as a regards to um, splinting implants is to, it's associated with what the parafunctional needs of the patient are, one, and also um, what the opposing dentition is. Now, I share with you, I started doing only graft through remote incisions. I got access to block grafts from the vertebral columns of patients that were procured as allografts from cadavers. And I use a block that's particular that I only go to, and it's from Rocky Mountain Tissue Bank. And so when we were using, I used particulate my entire journey since 1993, 96, where I was starting to do sinus grafts. But here's my reality. The block grafts weren't available to 2007, 2008. When I started using the block grafts, we to be true, which is why I showed that case 2012, 2014, 2016, and I told you I had 2018, is we wanted to see how the block graph was holding up. A lot of block graphs historically, when you look at them over a while, they, they still resorb, even though they might have uh, Wolf's Law where you have an implant in bone. So my comment to you is I was doing splints with my implant supported solutions because I was concerned to see if my only block graph is going to hold up. A lot of those cases I showed 10 years old. And the reason why I showed them 10 years is because I'm maintaining them now and they're still functioning well. Next question. What is your opinion in doing upper partial overdentures? That's a great question. That's a great question. And I, in my experience with upper partial overdentures, is as follows. Upper partial overdentures, when you say partial, I would imagine we're talking about posterior dentalist sites. I think just like we used to use precision attachments, if you put implants, distal, 
and anterior teeth and you were locking in partials um, like over locators, you're doing the patient a great service. But when you say overdentures, I'm not the biggest fan of an overdenture prosthesis um, because I just find I have more challenges with an over maxillary overdenture. I'd rather try to convince the patient to invest a little bit more or maybe so I can create a completely fixed over it, uh, completely fixed denture. Um, but I have have cases where I have distal extensions, have implants, have locators, and the anterior teeth are crown and bridge, and we snap the partial in place. And I think that's a great solution for them, the patients, please. And it works out great. And obviously it saves some money. I hope that answers that question. 